Coming up is a man who needs very little introduction. But for those of you who have not come upon Jeff Builder, he is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Crossref. His first metadata moment is a very special one. So those of us who remember going into a library, before there were barcodes for checkout, or, um, scan barcodes, whatever, we used to have little pouches, right, where you check out the card, you write your name on it. There were some precocious few who would go in and examine all of those who came before him as the basis by which this book was worthy of his time and attention. So he looked for names that he recognized who were one older and two cool enough to be part of his circle. And in my opinion, I think that may have been the world's first recommendation system at the age of age seven for Jeffrey Builder. The embarrassing thing about that is that it's absolutely true. Um, so if you're looking for thematic consistency here, um, the only thematic consistency I can actually give you is that uh, my colleague in Crossref Labs has collaborated with Stephanie on a number of projects, and the person who's coming after me, Patricia Cruz, uh, we collaborate with them uh, all the time, and uh, with DataCite all the time. And, and the theme of this is collaboration and partnering. Um, and um, let's see, where are we? And um, and so. I'm try, you know, I was given this 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 theme. It's it's one of our major themes, um, as far as our strategic roadmap goes, and um, and I was struggling a little bit with trying to figure out what to say to you um, that isn't said, for instance, in our annual report or in our blog posts. Um, but I hope I've come up with a few things. I'm going to talk about really uh, three areas that are sort of implicit in a lot of things that we talk about that, but that we don't talk about explicitly and may give you a little view of what's going on uh, behind the scenes. Um, I also am um, going to try and make this short because if you've looked at your schedule, you'll see I'm doing two other talks today. And quite frankly, even I'm getting um, Jeffrey Builder fatigue. Um, it's <laughs> talks. So I don't want to subject you to too much. But let's, let's move ahead. Um, and this is enough, because when we talk about collaboration, of course, one of the things about Crossref is that fundamentally that's everything we do, right? The biggest thing Crossref does is it actually takes these thousands and thousands of members and provides a venue for them to collaborate and make sure that links and citations and metadata are easily exchanged that links continue to work and that, and that they're able to talk to each other without having to have multiple bilateral relationships, right? This is what we do. It's built into our DNA is helping people collaborate. But there's a whole other series of collaborations that we do. We do everything from sort of industry consulting to, um, you know, providing people with APIs and these things are not quite as obvious. So, in my mind, some of the best collaborations we do are the invisible ones, right? These are the ones that you don't see. We don't actually have to do much in order to engage with them. And we actually are not even sure how we're collaborating with them. We're collaborating with people because we've provided APIs that people can use. And sometimes we know what they're doing. And if you look at our blog posts, you'll see a, an excellent series of blog posts about people who are using our API. The truth is, there are lots of people, we have no idea what they're doing with our APIs. We have theories about all the kinds of things they're doing. They're pushing metadata into citation management tools. They're building metrics tools. They're, they're you know, looking up and trying to resolve references. They're doing all of these kinds of things. But, but truly, the only real hint that we have uh, is that we see them showing up on our charts. They're constantly using our APIs. They're getting data. They're refreshing data. They're updating data. And um, as Chuck mentioned yesterday, our API usage is, is really high, right? So all of these people are collaborating with us. And as I said, it's the best form of collaboration because we don't have to do a heck of a lot except look at these charts and watch people access the metadata that's in the system. So that's, that's something that we don't often think about 
when we're talking about collaboration, but it's one of the fundamental things, I think, that we're providing, not just to our membership, but also to the wider scholarly communications community. And just even the talks yesterday that we had by, you know, Bianca and Jody show that, like, researchers are also using this metadata uh, to look at things. In our annual report, we talk about what I think is perhaps in most people's mind when we, minds when we talk about collaboration um, uh, with other parties, and that's sort of industry groups. Um, and, and again, what I don't want to do, because our annual report does a much better job of it, um, and our blog post, is I don't want to go and enumerate every single collaboration that we do. We have, we, we've listed, this is probably actually still a subset. Every year we go through this process where we say the annual report's coming out. Can people say what projects they're working on and what groups they're with? And, and we all sit there and we go, you know, we spend weeks sort of adding things. Oh yeah, that's right, we're in this group. Um, and so this is probably a partial list, but we, we, are, we, we tend to be people who are approached when people are trying to figure out how to gather a group of publishers together to solve a problem, or a group of publishers and librarians and researchers and so on and so forth. But I think one of the things that isn't quite so known is what happens, how do these things get started with us? And what is the process that they go through um, uh, when, 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 we, when, we, when we work with people? And specifically, I, I want to talk about this because if you probably looked at this title and thought it's a bit odd, right? Selectively collaborating and partnering with others. That selectively is kind of a weird word there. Uh, but it's an important word because um, we do choose who we're going to work with quite deliberately. And I wanted to explain a little bit about how we make those kinds of choices and, and what the process is uh, once we've made a choice to collaborate with people uh, and to work on a project. So the process usually starts with people asking us, saying, sometimes demanding and raising their fist that we do something. You know, we want conference identifiers. Um, we want a way of uh, getting open, all, you know, met information about how um, research is being used outside of the scholarly communication systems. Um, we need the ability to uh, identify grants. Uh, we need the ability to unambiguously uh, identify affiliation information, right? And if there's a big enough group and if there's a loud enough group, they generally come to us. Um, and of course, the first thing that we do is we say, okay, fine. And this is one of the biggest roles that we often play is we, we form a, con we, we're a convening forum. Uh, and so what we do is we convene a, a, work group, a working group. And that working group generally tries to evaluate projects. And I've, this is a, um, in a sort of grid here, right? Where if you look at the, and this is supposed to be a gradient, but I couldn't do gradients easily in, in Keynote. Um, but if you think of this as from, you know, the X axis being from uh, items of narrow interest, right? Maybe only to a subset or a small subset of our members, and then on the other side, you've got a broad interest, things that are probably of interest to a lot of our members, right? And if you think of the sort of y-axis as going from things that might be proprietary and outsource, that's, that is the only way that we can do them is to actually uh, outsource it or to work with somebody else completely in order to accomplish this, right? All the way up through community owned and managed. And what community owned and managed means is that we have control of it. We don't have to worry about, you know, about lock-in, things like that. One of the things that we do implicitly when we talk about a project is we try and slot it in to one of these squares. And the ideal is, 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 is stuff that's in the green area, right? So as an example of this, for instance, let's think of something like um, affiliation identifiers, right? Almost everybody every one of our members is interested in being able to accurately identify affiliations and to be able to do that unambiguously. It doesn't matter if you're in the social sciences or sciences or humanities, everybody's going through research assessment uh, exercises and things like that, and anything that can make that process of gathering information about what research is coming out of what you know, institutions is going to benefit everybody um, in the community. Now let's contrast this a little bit 
with something that would probably tend towards the upper yellow square, which is conference identifiers. Now, it's not to say that we're not working on conference identifiers. We have an interest group who's very, you know, who has asked us specifically to help facilitate conference identifiers. But the truth is that it's a different subset of our members who are interested in that, a large and sizable subset of our members. But of course, it drifts over towards that sort of less common, less broad appeal um, than, 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 for instance, uh, affiliation identifiers. And then you have things like similarity checks, right? Which is a very interesting one because it is a very broad interest, but at the moment it's mostly outsourced and it's mostly uh, through a third party. So again, that falls into one of these yellow quadrants. It's not that we don't do these things, it's just that we have to be quite cautious when we're doing these things. And one of the reasons that we have to be cautious when we're doing these things is that if these things that we're doing become essential infrastructure, we really do want to have a level of control and a level of ability to manage those things um, that because, because, it's, because, it, it, because we're all dependent on it, right? And so it is our responsibility to make sure that we're able to provide that control. So one of the things that we do in a working group is we, you know, at least we don't maybe explicitly sit there with a chart, but this is one of the processes we go through when we're evaluating um, a project and, and how much resource and how much energy uh, we're going to be putting into it. So the, the, the next thing that almost inevitably happens in, um, in, in a working group is that it splits in two. Um, and one of the uh, groups is generally a group tasked with figuring out what the technical um, implications of the project are, and the other one is generally tasked with trying to figure out what the business model or uh, governance model of, of the project might be. So for instance, let's just use an example again. Uh, we've been working with a group of people who are interested in developing conference identifiers, right? And there have been two clear tracks of work, one is to figure out technically, you know, what it is that we would need to collect, what information we need to collect about conferences, how we'd register them, who would register them, what would happen there. And then there's going to be another group that's going to talk about, okay, what are the governance, you know, who, what do we expect people to do to maintain these records? Who's going to be able to register? How are they going to, you know, are they going to be able to join Crossref? Uh, what happens if they have conferences but they're not publishers and they don't generally assign DOI. So you'll have two groups that actually split out and talk about these two aspects of, of, of a potential uh, new service. Um, often, another thing that happens is that the technical group will prototype something. So again, if you look at a project that we've worked on recently called uh, distributed usage logging, one of the things that we did was we actually built out a full sort of working end-to-end example of what it might look like for a scholar, uh, scholarly sharing network to share information about usage of publisher um, articles uh, with the publisher in a counter compliant form. And this was, you know, we, we, we did, you know, the registration of metadata, we did the verification of sending the data, we made sure that it went all through the process to make sure that this was actually a tractable technical problem. What then typically happens is that these two groups reform back to the working group, right? And they come up with a recommendation of how to proceed. Um, and sometimes, believe it or not, things just stop, right? So even in the past few years, we've worked on a number of projects where we helped come up with plans for, you know, uh, the ability to indicate what you were, you know, uh, 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 what you were able to do with a document that you had in the scholarly sharing network. And some of these projects, you know, get to a certain stage, and if there's not enough interest, they stall there. Sometimes they stall, and then a year later they get revived because there's more interest in them. But if they just continue, then the big thing, the big decision is, is this thing that we're doing something fundamentally different than what Crossref has done in the past? Or does this fit into what we normally do uh, day to day? And I think what we categorize as what we normally do day to day is we collect and disseminate metadata from our members, right? So if there are ways that we can do something simply by building on that, that, that infrastructure, 
that's a fairly straightforward thing for us to do. Um, and, um, but if it isn't, right, if it's something that requires a new business model or a modification of our, uh, of our membership terms or our rules, or if it requires a major investment of resources, well, then it goes to the board. And the board will talk about it, and then they will make a recommendation about whether or not it goes into production. So we've got these two different tracks that some things take. Some can be, you know, and, and in either case, almost all of these things, because they are collaborative, they'll take sometimes months, sometimes years to go through this process. But this is what actually happens um, behind the scenes. Now, um, if you look at our strategic roadmap, you'll see um, a number of things uh, that, a number of subcategories of, of, of things that we do. And I just, before I finish up, want to talk about a, a few of them. Um, we subdivide things into sort of cross-ref-led community initiatives and non-cross-ref-led uh, community in, uh, initiatives, and then working with other infrastructure providers. So the, the, these, the, the last one I can talk about first, because we, you know, we're always talking to our colleagues at Datasite, we're always talking to our colleagues at ORCID. We're always talking to um, other parties who do, uh, uh, you know, persistent identifiers. Um, I know that Paul's in the room, and we've been working with him on how to, you know, how, how ISSNs and DOIs should be working uh, together in the future. Um, and that's just, you know, background material. But the middle two are interesting because, as I said, sometimes, I mean, most times, the canonical form is that our members come to us and they say, this is something that we think you can do. But over the past four or five years, what we're seeing more often is other industry groups coming to us and saying, we have an idea. Can you help us think this through? Can you help us provide us with technical consulting? Um, can you at least provide the convening form for putting this together? So it might not even be something that ultimately it looks like we're going to run, but we're often asked to give technical or governance or um, logistical advice about how to do these things. Um, and so um, in both cases, we often follow very similar patterns, but in some cases, those are things that are going to be driven by somebody outside of Crossref, and we may play a role. For instance, we may be this, you know, a, a place where they have to register necessary metadata for that, um, but sometimes um, it's enough for us to actually help them think through the thing, um, and then they can take it on uh, themselves. So, again, what I didn't want to do is just sort of repeat and reread the list of people that we collaborate and re-enumerate the, um, the actual projects we collaborate on. If you look at our blog, uh, we have updates on the things that we're doing with grant identifiers. We have updates on the things that we're doing with conference identifiers. We have updates on basically almost all of the projects that we're working on. Um, and um, and it's, it's, it's not worth just rehashing those things. But what I did think was re worth rehashing was the process that goes on behind the scenes when these things happen. So the other thing that I'd like to do before closing is say it's really important for everybody in here, our members, people who work with our members, to be involved in these things. These working groups are open to anybody. If you have an interest in something, if you are interested in seeing if the community can solve a certain problem, come to us. If you have other people who know, you know, we can at least tell you whether maybe we've had the same request from others. Maybe there is a critical mass. Um, maybe we can form a working group. Um, but also look at our list of working groups. Look at the lists that are out, uh, up on our website. And if you have an interest in a particular project, um, then we really, really could use your help by being on technical working groups, business working groups, um, because this is the way that we move things forward. So with that, I thank you, and you get more of me later on this afternoon. Okay, so let's have some questions. Anyone to get us started? Okay, sorry, I can't let you go too easily. So I think we talked a lot about the inner um, operations of how this works inside Crossref. Just to take a step back, since the overarching talk was about collaborations, can you tell me in your own words, why is collaboration so important to Crossref and its mission? Well, um, 
I mean, I think that it's, it's a scaling issue, fundamentally. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, a funder coming and say, saying, how can we, how can we um, communicate with, you know, X thousand publishers and get them to provide us with information about who's, you know, about funding information. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's impractical for the, so many, for people to go out and just talk to so many, so many different parties. Um, and um, I, I mean, that, that, that sort of zoom out that I did at the beginning, um, I do that because I often go off and I talk to non, you know, I, I mean, people are surprised, right? When you talk to them about uh, the, the publishing community, uh, inevitably somebody can name, you know, a dozen publishers, maybe. Um, and then when you sort of zoom out and you show them our membership and that actually you're not talking about, you know, you're not going to talk to 12 publishers. You're going to have to talk to thousands of publishers to get the critical mass that you're looking for unless then they real that that's, you know, then they realize that it's important for them to go through us because we can form that sort of convening function. But I think it's a scalability. Scaling. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Any questions from the room? Okay. Thank you so much, Jeffrey.